Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the fourth in our series of topical webinars from the Payments Knowledge Forum. These will be running at regular intervals until the summer when we will take a break before our two-day conference in London on September the 29th and 30th. You can get more information about these webinars, the conference and also up-to-date payments industry news event calendar and useful links on our website at www.thepkf.org. My name is Anton Godfrey and with us today as presenter on ATM 2020 is Aravind Karala, the founder and CEO of Cal. Cal is the world's leading ATM software company and the preferred supplier to leading banks such as Citibank, China Construction Bank and Unicredit. Aravinda is a world authority on software technology for ATMs. He was born in Sri Lanka and has a degree in electronics from King's College London and a PhD in computer vision from Edinburgh University. Aravinda worked with PA Technology, Coopers and Librand before founding Cal in 1989. Aravinda will speak for about 45 minutes, leaving time to take a few questions at the end. On the right of your screen, you should see a small control panel where you may type in any questions that occur to you during the presentation. We will try to get through as many as we can during the time available, or follow up afterwards. The whole event is being recorded in WMV format. A link will be sent out by email tomorrow, and will also be available through the pkf.org. There are many challenges currently facing ATM deployers and operators, such as decreasing profits, increasing expenses, regulatory compliance, for example EMV, PCI, etc., and security, card skimming, card trapping. But there are also great opportunities to modernize the ATM experience with, or following on from, the migration to Windows 7, with mobile and branch integration and a much more improved experience. So, what will ATMs be like in six years' time? To get Cal's view on this, it is my pleasure to hand you over to Aravinda Karala. Thank you, Anton, for that uh, introduction. When uh, Anton and Denise asked me about forecasting the future, I thought, well, uh, that doesn't seem like a good idea for me to agree to that, but uh, I did anyway. So I, start, I looked for inspiration on the internet and there was this very first interesting thought from Niels Bohr who said, prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. And I agree. Um, the second bit of advice I got was, well, when you um, look at a very long time out, what seems to happen is that people tend to over sorry, I uh, tend to overestimate what might happen over a very long period, like say 20 years, but then they tend to underestimate what might happen over a shorter period. So I thought, well, I will try to take that uh, into account when I'm forecasting, and well, the six, six years forward that we're looking is not too um, far out anyway, so I need to kind of get the balance right on my forecasts. And then the thing that really gave me confidence is that last point, uh, somebody said that forecasting is the art of saying what will happen and then explaining why it didn't. Uh, so I'm really hoping that Dennis and uh, Anton will invite me back in six years' time to explain why my forecasts weren't uh, correct. So here we go with that uh, thought. First of all, a little bit about the backdrop. Uh, you know, what will the world look like in 2020 before we start talking about ATM? So this is something that I got from the internet. Uh, with some slight modifications uh, with new data that I got uh, this week. So almost 8 billion people in the world. GDP will be 40% higher than it is now. Uh, most people, uh, more than half of people uh, uh, around the world will live in cities. And uh, China's GDP will overtake uh, uh, the US, uh, it said. But actually it turns out that, strangely enough, there was a particular piece of uh, uh, information that came out this week. It was actually released this week based on a World Bank study and it looks as if on a PPP basis 
uh, China will overtake the U.S. this year. And that was actually published in the Financial Times a couple of days ago. Um, so that means that in 2020, China will perhaps be 10 or 20 percent ahead, given the rate at which it uh, grows at the, at, the, at the moment. And, and I think that will also uh, uh, change the way uh, the world looks at all kinds of issues. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go uh, into this presentation. Six billion people with mobile phones. Well, in fact, uh, almost every, every adult has a mobile phone already, and, and that applies even in Africa. Five billion people with internet access, smartphones. This is quite an interesting forecast from the internet that uh, and the processors will be faster pretty much and bigger pretty much than standard PCs today. 10 gigahertz processors, one terabyte storage, just in a tiny smartphone that you'll be holding in your hand. 50 billion connected devices globally because most of our hardware will be connected to the internet. That's a huge, huge number. Oh, and uh, a quick little forecast. Uh, I think that the last door is to ATM would have been decommissioned finally. But let's talk a little bit about ATMs in 2020. Well, China is likely to have 800,000 ATMs and would have taken, overtaken the US by quite a large margin. The EU plus the US probably together will match the, the Chinese number. And in many ways, I think the story of 2020 will be that in many aspects of business, the EU and the US need to pull together in order to match Chinese numbers. Um, now, this third point here, as you can see, I'm staying a little bit conservative on this one. I'm not forecasting huge changes to the way ATMs are structured. I think it will be mostly a Windows ATM world now focusing here just on bank ATMs, uh, running Windows 8, Windows 9, perhaps Windows 10 if it is out by then. And then, of course, there will be some Windows 7 and perhaps a little bit of XP still left and some Linux. So I'm forecasting, I think, still that uh, all bank ATMs will still have a PC core and that bank ATMs will have large touch screens compared with today. But that if those are bank ATMs. Um, but I'm also uh, uh, forecasting here that I think there will be m many more low-cost ATMs, and these will be primarily non-bank ATMs operated by ISOs, and, and I think Android and Windows will dominate. And there is a reason I say Windows here, because uh, you see in that bracket I'm saying Windows Full and Windows Compact, Win Windows Compact being the CE version of Windows, but there is a little bit of interesting news here. Windows 4 uh, is going to be free of charge from Microsoft for ATMs that are less than 9 inches in screen in terms of the screen size. So I think, uh, assuming that Microsoft doesn't change their mind, and this is really about Microsoft uh, taking on Android, then the full Windows, um, if you like, free of charge to hardware vendors, uh, is likely to um, I turn up in, in those low-end ATMs. The screen size will need to be relatively small for those ISO ATMs, 9-inch screens. So I think, uh, so I'm predicting here that it will perhaps be 50-50 as we get to 2020, that uh, half of them will be running Android and the other half will be running perhaps Windows 4 because really the business case for Windows Compact won't be there anymore at that point. The Next slide here is courtesy of RBR. Um, these are their numbers from their 2018 forecast that they published recently. And as you can see, what I did was to take uh, these numbers and, and extrapolated it to 2020 by just with a straight linear extrapolation. Four million ATMs globally, with uh, pretty much half of it in the Asia Pacific region. Um, the Western Europe and North America not growing very much, pretty much uh, flat, if you like. Latin America growing not so strongly, and Central and Eastern Europe growing quicker. And then, of course, Middle East and Africa growing faster. And the, cha the chances are that the Afri African growth is being uh, underestimated here, because my guess is they will start to catch up quite soon. It's hard to know when the knee of that curve is going to be, but I would have thought that it would be before 2020. So. I think that African number is probably an underestimate.
So let's kind of drill down a little bit more into what the PC is going to look like in uh, 2020. So this is the ATM PC core. And I think um, the, the smallest PC you'll be able to buy with an ATM in 2020 will probably have a much faster CPU at 4 gigahertz, much more RAM at 16 gigabytes. Even if you can't really use it, that's probably what you're going to be able to get, even as the smallest uh, uh, PC core that you can get. Faster, bigger mass storage, I'm, I'm suggesting a, a one terabyte SSD. Because, you know, just like today, even though the ATM might be using only 50 uh, gigabytes of hard disk, you still you know, need to buy a 500 gigabyte uh, device because, you know, it's just uh, too expensive to manufacture those small uh, size uh, machines just for a small market like the ATM market. So the, the ATM market will uh, need to stay up to speed with uh, what the PC business is doing because that is, of course, the way that uh, ATMs will keep their costs under control because obviously it is the right thing to do for the components of the ATM that can be from a mass market like the PC market or like the Windows market that it stays with that market because, you know, Windows, for example, is a tiny part of the total cost of running an ATM. So I, I'm forecasting here that Windows will dominate uh, bank ATMs uh, even in 2020 and that uh, also that there will be uh, bigger touch screens, for instance, on those ATMs because I think that's the direction in which uh, banks are going and, and, and customers obviously prefer those kinds of nice big touch screens and, and, and very nice uh, user interfaces that, that will allow uh, on, on, on their ATM experience. But of course, having said that, uh, there will still be some ATMs that were bought in 2010. As you know, the, uh, uh, the replacement cycle is about seven years. Uh, but uh, of course, a lot of banks don't replace uh, ATMs uh, in that seven year time period. Um, 10 years is uh, perhaps uh, not unusual and, and as you know there are still some OS2 ATMs running so those are incredibly old. But uh, my guess is in 2020 there will still be a small proportion of ATMs from 2010 and obviously a lot uh, more uh, newer machines that will be only a couple of years old and perhaps with the, the kind of spec that I'm listing up there. Um, this slide now, I'm, I'm going to look at specific aspects of the ATM market. Um, 2020, I'm, com I'm, I'm uh, comparing cash dispensing with cash recycling here and asking the question as to whether uh, that uh, ratio is going to change. And I think uh, definitely yes, I think. Um, cash recyclers, as I say here, will come from the Eastern markets. The Japanese today, have pretty much 100% of Japanese machines are recyclers. And in fact, Japan uses the word ATM um, uh, to mean exactly a recycler. And they have a different word for cash dispensing machines. They call them CDMs. Um, because it is normal for Japanese uh, ATMs to have full functionality, uh, especially recycling. And then uh, the Chinese numbers have increased uh, very rapidly. Um, only a few years ago, around 40% of ATMs were recyclers in some of the big banks like China Construction Bank, who are a Cal customer. CCB have 77,000 ATMs today, and 60% of their ATMs are recyclers today. So I'm not forecasting that that's going to increase to 100%, because in the Japanese situation, it is 100% partly because that is just what Japan does. And once you get numbers like that, it is very, very hard for any manufacturer to sell a CD machines, a cash dispensing only machines because of economies of scale. So, so that you know, it's either 60% if you like, or 100% there isn't an in between because it's because very quickly the business case begins to disappear for the smaller proportion. So, I think 60 to 70% is probably the right number because in China at the moment, anyway, what they do is to decide on a location by location basis whether to put. Uh, a, a cash dispenser or a cash recycler and just through sheer calculation of business case they come up with this 60 percent number as the stable number. Uh, it might still increase a little bit but I'm uh, guessing that it, pro it probably won't get to a hundred percent Japanese type scenario. And I think uh, my bullet point number three is that the EU and US will actually go down that route of recycling. It'll take a, a little while for that to happen 
there are of course small numbers of recycling projects in the EU and the US. Um, so my forecast here, 20 percent of new ATMs in the West uh, will be recyclers in 2020. But of course those dispense only machines will fight back with uh, better pricing, which means that uh, you, you know the, um, the, the price uh, point will define what percentage of ATMs will become recyclers because recyclers always will have to be a little bit more expensive given that it's a much more complicated mechanism. Looking at now forward to EMV in 2020, while well, I'm forecasting that the world will finally be on its way to EMV everywhere, uh, the US, China, Japan and India will, I'm saying, miss their deadline of 2017, but they will be getting there. And I think by 2020 what will be happening is that the few laggard ATMs that are there would be attracting uh, all of the fraud and I think that uh, that would mean that there would be a significant clear business case for them to really get on with and change those ATMs. So in fact I think there is a real possibility that uh, there will be zero machines on uh, that, that are not uh, chip enabled by 2020. So, uh, you know, final bullet point there is really that the pressure would be on to, for everybody to really to get to EMV. Fraud on ATMs, well, I think uh, really a, a, a optimistic uh, point of view here, I think fraud on ATMs will finally be under control. The max drive really is the problem in keeping fraud high even in uh, Western Europe where it is EMV, but obviously having to fall back to max drive creates fraud which comes in from other countries, essentially in importation of fraud. But I think once uh, the, the big countries are converted to EMV, then there will be a lot of pressure on other people uh, to be EMV compliant. And I think um, I, I'm boldly forecasting here that uh, by 2020, the max strike will be banned and that it won't be possible to do, um, you know, card skimming. Uh, fraud will be just a, a bad memory. The total amount of fraud, just looking at the U.S. only, and the, the, the number there, the, the last bullet point there, is in 2009, according to Forbes, uh, fraud was a, a, a unbelievable 190 billion U.S. dollars in that year alone. Uh, now, not all of that is ATM. In fact, ATM fraud is a small part of that. Quite a lot of this is uh, card holder not present transactions and uh, fraud on the internet. But still. It's a huge, huge amount of fraud, and I think by 2020 we'll be on our way to producing those things. I'm not going to forecast what I think is likely to happen outside the ATM world in terms of um, um, internet fraud and so on, because uh, basically I don't know much about that. But uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's going to be much better than it is today. Aravinda, we have a, a question from um, Hugo Montel. Sure. Um, He's asking that um, you're forecasting Android as a possible operating system for ISO ATMs. How do you propose the security hardening in those ATMs? Well, I think, of course, security hardening is a very complicated conversation, I think. I don't know whether it is uh, this uh, uh, forum for that uh, conversation, but uh, Android at the moment is a big issue because, of course, uh, uh, on, on, on mobile phones, Android is uh, attracting all of the malware issues at the moment, and 97% of malware is today targeted on Android uh, uh, phones. But I think the difference between a handset and a, a bank or deployer control machine is that there is a much better ability to uh, lock down those machines. Uh, and I think there will be third-party solutions as well as um, deployer solutions that will lock down those Android machines just as much as you can lock down Windows ATMs. Because today, Windows ATMs have a similar problem on the PC side where you know, all of malware is targeted on, on, on these big machines or, or for the Windows uh, environment. But of course, we know how to lock down those Windows ATMs very tightly. And the real difference is between an, a deployer or bank controlled uh, machine versus what uh, uh, consumers use. Uh, because obviously nobody controls the software on those machines and, and people always often very relax with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. So contactless
on ATMs in 2020. Um, I, I think uh, ATMs will support contactless cards. It is very important to do that. Contactless cards are very popular for, uh, from a customer perspective. It, does, uh, it, it, it is much easier to use, especially in a point of sale scenario. And, and touch and go is very nice, especially if you can do that without a pin for low value transactions. Uh, contactless EME transactions uh, um, will be supported, I'm saying, with plastic cards and smartphones. As you know, the spec is almost ready now and pretty much can be used to do contactless EME transactions. And then my point three here is that there isn't in many ways a huge business case for contactless pin, uh, sorry, uh, contactless on an ATM, partly because you still, uh, are, you're still going to have to enter the pin. And that means that contactless pin is not going to be the same user experience as at a point of sale where you can do a small value transaction incredibly quickly or, or, or for example, pay for a metro uh, uh, gate entry just in a very, very short period of time. While that ATM transaction still is going to take a little bit of time, you're still going to have to enter your pen. You're still going to have to go through that transaction. It's going to make that transaction quicker. But uh, so therefore, I don't think that necessarily that uh, uh, banks would be saying, hey, here we are, we're going to give you contactless uh, plus pin because that's very nice for you. I think much more the other way around where people just get used to using contactless all the time and they're going to be saying, give us this uh, contactless plus pin because really it doesn't make any sense for me to have a different card for my ATM. But I'm saying here that contactless fraud will become an issue because the, the thing is you can skim uh, contactless cards. This is not, of course, uh, uh, chip card uh, transactions, but you can take uh, Max Stripe like data out of the contactless card. And, and it seems to me that at the moment this is a big problem waiting to explode and, and people don't seem to be taking this seriously enough because the real issue is, you know, the, you know I hear stuff about, well, you have to have a reader that is two inches away, but the but problem is you can actually build a reader if you want that, that can read these contactless cards from a distance. Now, of course, you can't do an EME transaction because EME, as you know, is end-to-end -end secure, but you can uh, skim uh, uh, from, from a chip, and then you can use that to do transactions that are things like card will not present and so on. So unless the uh, max stripe is banned and nobody acquires max stripe transactions, then contactless fraud might become an issue as well. Uh, so I'm saying 2016 will be a problem, but I think by 2020, because I'm forecasting that uh, max stripes have been banned, it also means that you know any skin data from a uh, contactless card would be also equally useless because you wouldn't be able to do a transaction that is uh, not an EME transaction. Now to look at uh, the ATM transaction set, where is that going to go? You know that uh, there are big differences between countries. You know, some countries like, for example, the UK where I live, the transaction set is very limited, while in other countries like in China, for example, th th there are, uh, it, it's pretty much a full transaction set, about 100 transactions in the ATMs that we run in China. And in uh, other countries like, for example, in Israel, uh, they have almost all the, uh, the tele-transactions on, on kiosks. Okay, perhaps it's not the same thing as an ATM, but the, 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 the thing is that it is on a self-service machine and they could be putting that on the same ATM provided you know, it doesn't block queues and so on. So I think what I'm forecasting here is that I think the transaction set is going to expand everywhere and I think uh, different parts of the world are going to learn from other parts of the world because you know, if you do something incredibly new that has never been tried before, that is quite high risk. But if, if for example, uh, a country learns from another country, uh, then the, the business case is easier to justify for that first bank that does that. Um, and, and, and because at the end of the day, what people like is, isn't really that different. Now, as I travel around the world, I hear a lot about you know, how you know, this country is very unique and the other country is really unique and so on. But quite often, that uniqueness is really about what the banks and the customers have together done in the past, not really about whether if you bring out something like personalization and marketing, will customers be happy with that? So I'm forecasting that really personalization and marketing, very much a, a US idea in my view, is really going to uh, take over the world, that, uh, that really it is the next stage of industrialization, if you like, where uh, um, a personalized product, and, and in this sense not just software and ATMs, 
but also cars and so on. But that's perhaps where the world is going to go. You know, it's, it, we started off with personalization when things were done manually, you know, one at a time. Then, of course, Mr. Ford came, and we had cars that were identical. But I think we're going to go back to the, the possibility of more personalized hardware software, but at a cost that is similar to a mass-produced uh, product. So personalization, marketing, one-to-one -one stuff. Yeah, I think that the, the, the world is going to learn, learn from the U.S. Check 21, another thing I think uh, the world is going to learn. I, I, I'm forecasting here that checks are going to be around still in the countries that still do check. Of course, checks are going away uh, in most other countries, not so uh, common in, uh, in, in a lot of countries, but still. I think uh, cost reduction through these kinds of automation uh, seems like an obvious thing to do. The EU, I think, teaches the world EMV and security. It does that today, and it does that well. And I think there is some uh, the world is going in that direction. I think it seems to me that Asia is teaching us all about recycling and extended transaction sets. So, so I think some of what is going to happen here is that things have, that have been demonstrated to be successful in other countries will be exported. And it will be a much more global world, much more globalization. Um, vendors would be able to travel to other countries and deliver solutions without having to have the, the complex barriers that they've seen in the last 10 years. AT management in 2020, um, well, you know, uh, there isn't a big forecast here. I'm just saying it's going to be much better than it is today. Um, Software is going to be updated online even when the operating system is updated. Banks will be updating their software regularly, I think, in order to stay competitive. Um, I, I still hear banks saying, well, you know, I, 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 if I didn't have to change my software uh, in 10 years, then I'll be happy. I, I think I find that very un, uh, strange because, you know, this is a very important business tool. Uh, I'm sure you don't run uh, DOS on your laptops anymore. Uh, you don't run Windows from 10 years ago. And there are reasons why you don't do that. Hardware monitoring, I think, is going to be a lot better than it is today. Of course, a lot of banks have what have this uh, today uh, real-time monitoring, instant knowledge about what's happening. But there's a whole bunch of banks who don't have that kind of technology. And then, of course, all of that means much better cost management. So ATMs still are incredibly expensive to own and operate and run. There's no doubt that uh, there is a huge amount of cost management that still can be done, cost reduction that still can be done. And I think uh, that will also change the attractiveness of cash to banks, uh, uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because I'm going to forecast that cash is not going to go away, and I'll show you some numbers in a little moment. So cash forecasting, uh, still, you know, loads of banks who don't really do uh, formal cash forecasting, or perhaps they do it manually, uh, and you know the cost of uh, not forecasting right is huge, you know that, because when, when somebody goes to the ATM to replace the cash, then there's still a large amount of cash still left, and obviously you don't want to be in that situation. So basically, Quick summary, banks are going to have uh, incredible visibility of their ATM networks by 2020. Biometrics, well, I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to sit on the fence on this one. I think biometrics is not a clear-cut uh, benefit uh, um, to, to everybody. Uh, India and Brazil will uh, forge ahead, and no, no doubt there will be a few other countries that do that. But I think other folk are going to be uncertain about pri privacy and, and data protection. And I think uh, uh, biometrics will also be limited by being an honest transaction because I really don't think that there will be a global agreement on doing off us biometric authentication on a global basis. These customers are not going to be comfortable with, for instance, their fingerprint being uh, authenticated when they travel around anywhere in the world. It's just too risky. I think, uh, I think there just would be too much. Uh, pushback from customers. But that doesn't, of course, stop banks doing it on a on us basis. So I think that will be the proving ground uh, for biometric uh, transaction uh, authorization. Uh, but those of us biometric authentications, I don't think it would have happened by 2020. So I'm saying card and pen still in 2020, especially for off us transactions, because really, if you have if your customers are going to travel around the world, and you know they're going to be traveling around the world much more than they are today, then card and pin, I think, is the only way they can do that. And of course, you do need to be a little careful that you don't move your customers so much to on us that they don't remember their pins when they travel abroad. So that will be a little challenge to handle. 
personalization, I guess I already covered this. So yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forecasting 2020, every ATM is, per, uh, the software is personalized. It means that as a minimum, uh, the ATM will recognize you and know what your language is, know what your favorite transaction is. And if you're going to pay your bill, it's not going to give you a list of 3,000 possible utilities. It's going to know who your gas company is, who your, yeah, your electricity company is, and so on. So that it's really focused to what you want to do, rather than having to scroll through a hundred pages trying to work out uh, where you know who your utility company is. So I'm saying the customer here is recognized as an individual. Again, you know, in, by this I mean not just as a card number, but as a person who has a bigger relationship with the bank than just uh, the card uh, account number that might have multiple accounts and so on that. Uh, are tied together so that you'd be able to do transactions with one card uh, on, on multiple accounts. One-to-one -one messaging, marketing, pretty standard, I think, by 2020. Now, assisted transactions. I think this is going to be the rising star in 2020. Um, more transaction types, as they get added to the ATMs, uh, will be added along with, I think, live video teleconnections. Why? Because I think that however much you can make a self-service ATM application incredibly wonderful in terms of the user interface, customers just will not feel comfortable with doing those transactions if they do the transaction only once in a while. Let's take an example. Let's say that somebody transfers money abroad uh, to, to an unfamiliar country once a year. You know, that's the kind of transaction that I don't think that even if it was really easy to do, that they would feel comfortable with doing it by themselves. If given the choice of, of being led through that transaction, I think a customer would always choose that second option of being uh, of an assisted transaction with a live video tele. And, and why a live video tele connection in this scenario? Well, obviously this is about getting the, the benefits of uh, self-service um, along with the benefits of quality customer service because really self-service uh, for an unfamiliar transaction isn't good service. Holding the customer's hand when he does that unfamiliar uh, transaction must be, of course, the definition of good service. And then if you're going to do that, then you do need to make sure that costs are optimized because, of course, today the way you do those transactions, today the way you hold your customer's hand is, of course, in a branch. That's why people go into that branch. Um, but, of course, we all know that branches are expensive. So I think the obvious direction to go out of there is not to kind of do self-service for everything and say, okay, please don't call us, you're on your own, uh, just use the ATM, just use the phone, or just use the internet. That's not going to be what I think customers see as high quality uh, customer service. There will, of course, be banks that target that uh, market, perhaps for youngsters who are happy to be on their own. But I think, generally speaking, especially the high value banks, the, the, the banks that see customer service as important, I think assisted transactions will be uh, the star in 2020, the rising star in 2020. I'm certainly not forecasting that all ATMs will be doing that in 2020. Perhaps a small proportion, maybe 20, 30 percent will be doing that. So obviously in order to do that, you'd need much higher network bandwidth because of course it's about video tellers and it's about assisted transactions with video tellers. Hi Aravinda, it's Anton again. Um, we've had a question in from Patrick. Uh, Jonkmans, and he asks if customers are going to talk via video conference call in a public room, so such as in a branch, or is this going to be a more private uh, type of service? Well, I think it, you know this forecast here is, if you like, within quotes, in a sort of a public place, but public place meaning um, a sort of a branch uh, area where there might be video rooms and you need to provide a certain amount of uh, privacy there. But, and, and from that point of view, I think it's no different than the privacy you would need for an ATM to some extent. Okay, maybe a little bit more. But on the other hand, you're not going to be discussing really sensitive things, I think, in this scenario, uh, unless you have significant uh, uh, privacy. So privacy is going to be very important. Uh, on the other hand, we're not saying, for example, that you would speak out your your PIN number because you would of course enter the card and PIN in the usual way in a highly private way but you would have a conversation about for example doing a transaction such as uh, transferring money say to, to Peru if you don't live in Peru from a, 
uh, from another country, and, and then you'd want that comfort that you've done the right thing, that you didn't enter the wrong country code and send it to Chile by mistake. You know, it's the kind of thing that people feel uncomfortable about, and I think it's that kind of uh, service. So yes, there needs to be a certain amount of uh, uh, of privacy, but, but I don't think that means that you have to have sort of a you know separated out rooms where you know you go into a room and close the door and so on. Perhaps some of those things as well, but um, but I think yes, a little bit more privacy than an ATM would normally have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, will smartphones reduce the need for ATMs? I think somebody asked that question at the beginning as well. Well, I think you know ATMs will always be needed for dispensing cash. I'm going to come up with some cash forecasts uh, for the future just in another moment, and I'm going to forecast that there'll be more cash in the world in 2020 than today. So I don't think ATMs are going to go away in a hurry. But even if uh, cash volumes go down over a much longer period, then ATM type machines are still going to be needed to do public access banking services because I don't think um, uh, phones and internet are going to take over 100% of the transactions on any kind of time scale. So uh, I, smartphones, I think, will much more complement ATMs. Uh, the ability to stage transactions on a smartphone and then fulfill it on an ATM, contactless transactions, of course, and you know, start on one channel and finish on another. I think that's really where phones and internet, will, that's the way that small phones and internet will interact with ATMs. So uh, ATM numbers, I'm going to forecast that it's going to continue to increase up to 2020 and probably beyond. And uh, let me kind of show you, oh sorry, just uh, that's going to come in a couple of slides time. Uh, just before I do that, um, Anton asked me you know, to forecast a little bit about uh, some of the standards. Well, I think it is going to be an XFS standard for ATMs. Uh, I, I don't think JXFS is going to make it for ATMs. I don't think Java is going to uh, turn up on, eight on the ATM itself, but of course there is a lot of Java on the server side. So I think ATMs are going to have an architecture similar to today. So taking a little bit from that first slide of mine, so I'm not proposing that much is going to change in this area. And I think the thin client versus thick client battle, I think that battle will continue to rage. I don't think there's a clear cut, there's going to be a clear cut winner in 2020. Updatable ATMs, um, this is uh, um, an initiative of ATMIA and, and uh, Cal was involved in this as well. We think that ATMs will be easy to upgrade by then, and in fact, uh, there is pressure on to make sure that ATMs are, in quotes, updatable in the sense that it is easy to go from Windows 7, Windows 8 to Windows 9, upgrade the software, upgrade the uh, PC part of it, uh, because really, at the end of the day, if you think about the fact that an ATM has a lifespan of 7 to 10 years, that the PC core and the software staying uh, for 7 to 10 years, really, I don't think that's going to be tenable. I don't think that makes any sense, because really, that part of the technology is moving at such an incredible rapid rate. And to say that you wouldn't want to change your hardware regularly uh, in terms of the PC core would be, I think, unusual. I, I don't think that will be the case by 2020. I think it will be the norm that the hardware, in other words, the, 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 the components, in other words, the, the cash dispenser and so on will last 10 years. But you're going to be replacing the PC core much more quickly, the software much more quickly. From that point of view, it will be much more like, I think, the aircraft uh, uh, experience, where quite often an aircraft may be 25 years old, but most of the components have changed over that time period, and probably only the, uh, the, the, uh, the external body of it hasn't changed over that 25-year time period. So I think the PC core and the software, uh, and, and here I don't just mean the operating system, I mean all of the software, will track what is happening in the internet, what is happening in the rest of the world, while, of course, the dispensers and the card readers don't need to move that quickly. So, so I think hardware lifespans will be seven years to ten years, but the software and the PC cores will move faster. And the ATMIA's updatable ATM logo program is about that. And uh, the first meeting was last month. And if you haven't joined the committee, please uh, do consider joining the committee. Because what ATMIA wants to do is to come up with a plan that makes it possible for the vendors and banks to cooperate in creating this updatable concept. A little bit about cash. So, is cash going to die? Well, I don't think so at all. And here, here, here is a little bit of that evidence. Now, that uh, um, graph that you see there 
is the total number of banknotes, and that's not the value, that's the total number of banknotes in the Eurozone uh, from 2002 to 2014. You see it more than doubled. And more interestingly, much, during much of that period, for about uh, uh, 10 years, the Eurozone had a war on cash. They were trying to convince people that they shouldn't use as much cash as they do. And in fact, you know, it was a failure because people like cash. People like cash for a whole bunch of reasons. And I've got a slide on what I think is the reason people like cash. I'll come to that in a little moment. And uh, because of that, uh, the, the European Commission dropped their war on cash. So as you can see, um, cash seems to be going up in a linear line. Uh, I don't think that's going to change in 2020. So I think there will be a huge need for ATMs still in 2020 in the Eurozone. And of course, the US is no different. As you can see, total number of uh, uh, notes in circulation has inc increased in the US recently. And that is, by the way, the number of notes, not the value. So the value of notes for the Eurozone and the US is increasing faster. This is the, the these are the numbers for the total number of notes, discounting hundreds and fifties as individual ones and uh, notes. Asian growth, even faster still, as you know. Much, many more transactions in China and India and across Asia. So cash is, is, continues to grow at an incredible pace today. And I, I, and I think it's not going to change in 2020. Perhaps we might begin to see the slowing down of cash, perhaps. But I think there's no evidence at the moment that that will be the case. So let's talk a little bit about why cash. Well, let me be a little bit uh, uh, cheeky here and say it is secure. It is much more secure than, a, uh, than electronic transactions today because if I gave a 10 pound note to somebody else, you know, that is a 10 pound note. Uh, it cannot suddenly become 50 pounds out of my, my pocket. So person to person payment uh, without an intermediary, that's one of the reasons why people like that. It is a limited liability tra uh, transaction. When I hand over a 10 pound note, it is 10 pounds. I don't need to go check my bank account to see that somehow or other that person's taken 50 pounds out of my bank account. You know, those concerns are just not going to go away in a hurry, I don't think. And to an extent, the electronic world hasn't made electronic transactions secure enough that those concerns are going to uh, go away. So my point to there, just jumping back up there again, uh, you don't need an internet connection, of course. Not sure by 2020, internet's going to be much more prevalent. It's going to be that much easier. But cash is still going to have that advantage that you don't really have to have an intermediary. You don't need to be telling somebody else about the transaction. You don't need to worry about whether that transaction was safe or not. You don't need to worry about malware on your personal device. And to an extent, the malware on the personal device, I think that would be a permanent issue. And, and why do I think that? Because it's not because it is a war that is going on. It's not that there is a fixed amount of malware and then as soon as the rest of the world works out uh, how to stop that malware, we're good. Because as you know, uh, when, when, when the, the industry comes up, uh, up with ways of blocking malware, then the malware authors find different ways of attacking it. Just to give you some numbers, uh, the um, PCI committee quoted McAfee as saying that in 2013, in one quarter, in a single bad quarter, McAfee discovered 20 million new pieces of malware in just one quarter. So just to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge we've got. And of course, you need to keep in mind that when malware people target uh, 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 personal uh, uh, devices, they're of course targeting bank transactions. Why? Because that's obviously where the money is, right? So bank applications are obviously a prime target for malware. So I think this problem is not going to go away in, 20, in, in 2020 unless somebody comes up with some incredible uh, uh, piece of technology that secures personal devices, then I don't think the problem would have gone away. So I'm forecasting no change. In other words, the, the battle between malware and the industry continues to rage in 2020. So I think cash, you know, would be sitting there saying, you know, I, I, you know I, malware is not a problem for me. Um, and of course, you know, uh, cash is anonymous. We all know a bit about that. And budgeting, which is quite an interesting thing. You, I, some of you have probably heard that in Japan, people take out cash in the morning and put back cash uh, that, that evening. Why do they do that? It's because they take out a certain amount of money. That's their budget for the day. It's the amount that they could spend on a Saturday going shopping. And of course, they have that cash in their purse. It's very easy to see whether you still have enough money to buy a chocolate 
because you know it's in your uh, in your purse. You don't need to do kind of maths in your head about uh, uh, you know whether you blew your electronic budget. Now I can see that there could be other ways of doing that. Perhaps your card will track how much money you have uh, chosen. Uh, sorry, how much money you have spent. Perhaps you'll have a little LCD screen on your card, and of course, some of you know that there are cards of that already. So there is technology that might help with that. So, but budgeting is just one of those things that makes cash uh, attractive. So, uh, so I'm forecasting that uh, uh, ATMs are going to be a healthy industry still in 2020. They're going to be much nicer than they are today to use, and uh, the technology is going to move along just a lot quicker than uh, it has done in the last uh, six years. That's it uh, from me, and Don, over to you. Okay, Randy, we've had a few questions uh, come in during the last few slides. Um, I'll pick um, one or two, and then we can answer the other ones offline. Um, there's one here from Peter Jessiman, who asks, when you talk about these advanced ATMs, cash recycling, etc., do you anticipate the physical size of the units come down from what we see today? Well, I think there might be two uh, directions in which this go I, uh, in which this goes. In that, I think yes, uh, um, a standard recycling ATM with the same functionality as you would see today, I think, will get smaller. And there are some incredibly tiny little machines in Japan, for example, where I go quite regularly because we do business there, that have really tiny footprints with a huge amount of functionality inside them, full recycling, including coins. However, I think also there will be bigger machines that do that, that might be installed, for example, in a branch that would be able to do full functionality. So things like check and uh, signature capture pads and perhaps passbooks and so on, a full setup. So when you look at, uh, if, you, if you think a little bit about a branch tellers uh, being too expensive, uh, branches being too expensive and having to do assisted uh, transactions with video tellers. So, so you could imagine a branch that has uh, quite a sophisticated machine that can do any kind of transaction that you would do in a branch, but you've got a video uh, connection to a remote teller. But then, of course, this machine is going to have uh, going to have to have lots of components in it, not just a recycling ATM as it is today. So I think those machines will be a, a lot larger, and I also think that those machines might have to be a little bit more plug and play because today when we talk to banks, banks have different transactions they want to do worldwide. So it won't perhaps be quite as much standardization, but maybe more plug and play in terms of the components that you would have inside those machines. And then I think uh, the, the machines would have to be a little bit larger to allow plug and play. So I'm, I'm, I'm forecasting two things. One is smaller machines for the high volume, just do one or two things very well for me, versus the, uh, the I can do everything kind of machine that would be more in a branch. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a couple on um, Bitcoin. Um, one being, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin's presence and its potential impact to the need for cash in ATMs? Well, I think um, it, it's easy to kind of um, say that, uh, you, you know, I think there's a very simple answer, which is that Bitcoin isn't a currency. Now, I know that might sound like uh, it's not what people are saying out there, but, but truly it, is, it isn't a currency. It is more uh, a commodity like... Uh, gold or whatever that is traded. And to the extent that people won't buy these things, then obviously there will be transactions. But I, 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 Bitcoin can never be a currency in the way that uh, the proponents would want it to be, if only because there won't be a central bank standing behind it. So if you go to uh, a coffee shop and you want to buy a coffee, um, to think about it today, you can't even buy a coffee in one country using the currency from another country. So even though you've got a currency from another country that's backed by the central bank of another country, you still would find that that currency, so if you take a euro and, and try to buy a coffee in the US, then it wouldn't be accepted. So uh, the Bitcoin, I, I think just no chance unless the central bank stands behind it. And at the moment, all of the evidence is that the Fed is not going to say, you know, the Bitcoin is, uh, 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 is going to be guaranteed by the Federal Reserve. Because the real problem is that its value is not controlled and, and managed and stabilized by a central bank. So therefore, if the value of uh, something that you trade with is going to jump around, then it is no longer a currency. It is now essentially a commodity. And it's, you, know, you could, of course, choose to pay with gold bars or choose to pay with platinum, but it's not what most of us do. Okay, um, a couple more. 
Um, well, we've had a few questions about um, uh, what, I, what I call mobile ATM. So, an ATM with a with a SIM card in it. Uh, wireless is is another word. Um, the question is. Uh, will ATMs be wireless or will large private TCP IP networks still be the norm uh, and how does that affect disaster recovery? Hmm, I think uh, wireless, um, from what I see at the moment, uh, wireless ATMs are not very popular today because still the, the quality of uh, uh, wireless is not uh, good enough for ATMs in most parts of the world. Uh, 3G quality is definitely not good enough. Uh, Wi-Fi still it's a little bit flaky, I think. 2020, I think it's hard to tell um, how, how good that infrastructure would be. It's, it's, of course, going to be outstanding in cities, but probably not elsewhere. And then, of course, if you think about satellite type connections, band, the, the bandwidth is then very poor. So, um, I don't know, I think I'm going to not forecast where wireless is going to go with regards to ATMs. Okay. Um, this many more questions coming in. I'll just try to pick a few um, and we'll, we'll, we'll answer the others uh, offline later. Um, this one here about um, ATMs adding supported transactions, but in developed markets users will be doing more of these online and via their bank's mobile apps. Uh, will the ATM simply become a terminal that offers functions requiring physical interaction? I don't think so because I think, yes, of course, people will be doing transactions much more with mobile phones and, and, and with the internet. But I think also there will be a, a continuing question marks about the safety of those transactions. And I also think that I'm predicting that in 2020 we won't have found the, the silver bullet to get rid of these uh, uh, security concerns. So I think the ATM will continue to be the secure way to do these transactions, incredibly secure and the, more so even in, in 2020. And why would an ATM be more secure than a PC or, or, or a phone? Just very simply, the, the software and hardware is controlled by the deployer, so it can be secure. Well, the problem with the PC and, and, and with the hand, and, and, and with the phone is that the consumer is uh, installing whatever he or she feels like on those machines. And I don't think that that problem is ever going to go away, certainly not by 2020. So I think the ATM will still be needed to do a whole bunch of transactions. And also I think a lot of people will probably have concerns, uh, even more so than they have today, about the safety of mobile and PC transactions. Okay, we'll do a, a final one, um, and then I'll pass all the other questions. Uh, we can do that offline. Um, the final one is, do you think that because of the level of sophistication and functionality there will be, uh, will there be a reduction in the independent owners of ATMs and deployers, I would imagine, as well? I don't think so, actually, because I think, if you think about it from a global point of view, there aren't very many independent owners outside of the English-speaking countries, as you know, partly because of regulation and so on, but also related to the cost of doing transactions. And one of the biggest issues uh, with merchant uh, refill is, of course, whether you can use those nodes, uh, yes or no. And, and there are rules about that in the, in the Eurozone, as you know, but also the rules are pretty similar in most other countries. Now, I think those rules are going to change, but also I think technologies are going to allow those kinds of transactions, sorry, uh, for, uh, it's going to allow third parties to run ATMs. So I think um, my guess is that um, on a global basis, uh, there will be more third party operators than there are today on a global basis. But if you ask me in the English speaking countries, would there be more? Uh, perhaps not, uh, because maybe uh, it's, it's come to a kind of a stable uh, ratio uh, after r very rapid growth in the early days. So, so that may be the, the, the ratio that other countries will get to over some period of time. Okay, thank you, Aravinda. Um, as you said in your introduction, uh, predicting the future is very difficult, um, but Thank you for your view in a, in a really excellent presentation. Um, for everyone still on, a link to this recording will go out tomorrow so that you can review all of the information at your leisure and we will aim to follow up on any of your questions which were not answered today. Our next webinar is scheduled for June and will be presented by Diebold. 
When final details are confirmed, we will inform everyone by email and through the website. In the meantime, please don't forget to keep in touch with what's happening at the Payments Knowledge Forum via the website www.thepkf.org. Thank you once again, Aravinda, and thank you all for attending. Goodbye.